Today uh, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, mixing Scala and Kotlin. Uh, I'll be the evil guy of uh, this day. Uh, on the agenda today, uh, why would we even do that? Uh, Scala, companion, objects and Kotlin. Uh, how to deal with functions, gRPC between the two languages, and uh, Kotlin coroutines. What I won't cover in this talk are uh, implicit, simply because uh, the code bases I worked with uh, didn't use them that much, and also no custom operators this time. So yeah, I know, uh, you hear mixing Scala and Kotlin, and you go like, why would we even uh, <laughs> like, like to do that? Uh, so let's uh, talk about a few possible reasons. Uh, first, if you're in a company where everybody loves Scala and functional programming, you're in a good place. Stay there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, usually that's not the case. Usually you'll have those guys uh, in your project who just want to use Scala as uh, better Java, kind of Java++, and they will break stuff. Especially, they will break your functional stuff. <laughs> and I know that because I'm, of those, I'm one of those guys. Uh, so probably they aren't doing it out of some bad intentions or because they are stupid. They just like uh, to get stuff done their way. So there are a few options to handle this situation. First, of course, is to educate them uh, and to convert to them to Scala functional ways. Uh, I think half of the talks today are about that, uh, so I won't steal ideas from people much smarter than me. So let's assume you try that and it didn't work out for different reasons. Then there is, of course, an option to get rid of it. Like you come to them and say, we feel that you don't care about applicative functors deeply enough. Uh, we need to part ways. Uh, but I do hope that's not how you handle situation, uh, disagreements at, uh, at your job. Uh, then there is also an option to say polyglot microservices and let them write their code uh, however they want. Uh, but uh, microservices are not for everyone. Oh, ah, I actually say that. Uh, so yeah, microservices are not for everyone, not a good solution for every problem. And maybe, for example, you're in Scala Monolith uh, and you're good with that. It works uh, for your company pretty well. Uh, or maybe you just have a lot of infrastructure in Scala and you just cannot uh, throw it away. So what do you do then? Of course, you can say, if they like Java so much, let them write everything in Java. Java has a nice interoperability with uh, Scala, so it even may work out. But that's a bit too harsh, don't you think? Like, nobody deserves that, literally nobody. <laughs> uh, or there is one, uh, an another option is let them use Kotlin. There will still be difficulties, but that's what my talk is all about. First, we're gonna speak about companion objects. Uh, you have this Scala class with one method that uh, receives a sequence. Pretty common. And it doesn't matter so much what it does inside of this sequence. Uh, then you want to invoke this class from Kotlin. So uh, we create an instance of the class, it uh, works well, we make sure that we import Scala sequence and try to pass it to Kotlin. And we get this message. So Kotlin thinks SIG is an ent interface and technically Kotlin is right, SIG is an interface, but it's also an object and Kotlin doesn't see it. One solution uh, would be to import companion object explicitly. Then we will use Kotlin import allies as uh, to give it a nicer name. Uh, still, invocation is a bit ugly since we also have to invoke apply explicitly. <coughs> Isn't there a better way? For collections, there actually is. Better option would be to create an adapter in Scala that will receive Java collection 
and convert it using as Scala method. If you're using Scala 12, there's a Java collections for that, or for Scala 13 and on, there's collection converters. And then from Kotlin, we just pass Java collection. Problem solved. Uh, that trick works well for collections, as I said. For other kinds of companion objects, you can use the previous uglier method. Okay, first problem solved. Let's move to the next one. <coughs> so, looking at this code, uh, on the left you have a higher order function definition from Kotlin, and on the right we have the same definition in Scala. You need to squint really hard to notice the differences. But are they really equal? So let's try to pass Scala Lambda to this Kotlin function. And we get this nice error saying that Scala unit is not a Kotlin unit. Well, in hindsight, that totally makes sense. Those are two totally different classes. And another problem is that creating this Scala unit is close to impossible from Kotlin code. So, uh, we could see that even earlier. Uh, so we figure out that uh, those two are definitely not the same, going back to the question. Although they look very similar, they aren't the same. And we could see that even earlier, if we just had looked at the classes behind the lambdas. So Kotlin uses something called Kotlin JVM function function zero in this case, and Scala is just Scala function zero. But those are two different uh, classes. There's no way for them to be interoperable. After figuring that out, uh, the fact that they are totally different, what would happen though if we change the return type of the lambda? So instead of uh, returning a unit, we will uh, change it to return an int. Since the classes are totally different, the problem should stay, right? Turns out, they are interchangeable. You can pass Scala lambdas to Kotlin, and you can pass Kotlin block to Scala, which is a really nice way to reduce your functional code. The only catch is that uh, there is no compilation check between Kotlin and Scala if you do that. So if we just forget to return the correct type, I just omitted uh, the one, uh, my fun function should have returned an int, a uh, compiler will let it pass and we'll get an exception at runtime. Next is the gRPC. It's quite popular in uh, JVM world. Uh, I worked with that quite a lot. So the following uh, problem comes from one of my projects. gRPC uh, is a, a remote uh, procedural call. It uses protobuf to describe the messages and it generates implementations for different uh, languages based on uh, those descriptors. For Kotlin and Scala, it means that it will generate two classes, same as previous example, with the same name and same package. Uh, but they aren't interchangeable. There is Kotlin data class on the left, and there is case class on the right. And although they uh, have the same fields and uh, they are doing the same function, they, they have the same functionality, they aren't equal. As we've seen previously, while it's possible to invoke uh, Scala code from Kotlin, it might get quite ugly. Uh, Kotlin code is easier to reuse from Scala, but you might get clashes, since both classes have same names and same packages on the, inside the same JVM. Worst part of that is that code may compile just fine, but at runtime, Scala classes <coughs> will be loaded instead of Kotlin ones. Surprise! So, uh, wouldn't it be great to avoid those uh, imports of uh, proto-classes and those clashes? So, here's how. Every protobuf message can be converted to a byte array and parsed from a byte array. That's one of the properties of the protobuf protocol. And so, we encoded before sending 
Then we decode it in Kotlin, which will uh, return us a, an instance of a Kotlin class. Then probably we we'll should do something with this message, and before returning in, uh, the response uh, back to Scala, we will encode it again to byte array. And coming back to Scala, we'll parse uh, the byte array again, and we'll get the Scala class. So there, are, there will be no clashes. It's uh, important to rely here on type inference. I didn't specify types explicitly anywhere here, uh, since uh, imports and specifying types may uh, mess things again. Of course, uh, this uh, conversion incurs about one uh, millisecond overhead, but taking into consideration the fact that you'll be doing I.O. anyway, uh, most of the time the costs aren't so big. The actual conversion shouldn't be implemented by hand, uh, since you're using gRPC here anyway, we generate code, you just can provide your own generator to do that for you. And the last topic is coroutines. So for those that uh, maybe don't know, coroutines are similar to lightweight uh, threads or fibers. Uh, and here we have a Kotlin class with uh, two methods. One is an asynchronous method. And uh, another retu uh, that uh, returns us a deferred uh, result. And another is a suspending method. So suspending method is uh, like blocking, uh, but instead of uh, blocking a thread, it uh, suspends a coroutine. And uh, our class also has this uh, coroutine context, which is like execution context from Scala. Let's try to use uh, the first method from Scala. It even may look like it's working, until you try to get the result. Now, so in await method, uh, as you can see, it has no argument. <coughs> but uh, when you try to invoke it, you'll get this message. So it says, although there are no arguments, it expects <coughs> something called continuation with a very, a very weird generation, which I'm not sure uh, uh, we could uh, even use, uh, and it simply doesn't make any sense. Let's try another approach. We have the second method, which is just a suspending method, and let's try to invoke it instead. It should be quite simple. Uh, no. Although we have, one, uh, we have one argument, now the compile requires us to pass uh, continuation as a second parameter. And there's no good way to create this continuation, so again, no luck. Does this mean that we cannot uh, combine <coughs> Kotlin coroutines and Scala though? <coughs> one of the ideas that may have come to your mind is to try and pass and Scala future to Kotlin code and then complete it inside the coroutine. Uh, but this won't work because you need to pass the execution context too. Which means so you, uh, you pass the gorilla in the jungle uh, when you wanted only the banana. But <coughs> there is something else then that will help us. And this something else is, weirdly enough, Java. <laughs> In Kotlin, we can import something called coroutines future package, and we'll get a method that converts Kotlin deferred value into Java completable future. Now, Java completable future can be converted to Scala future in the Scala world. Or to any, any other future for this method. 
So, if we can uh, use any other future, why not use Zio? So, Zio has a from future for a Scala future and effect async for a Java completable future. And here I uh, use uh, the one for Scala. So here uh, is a short example I put. Um, the result on the top is the completable future from uh, before. If we can see that the code is uh, indeed concurrent. So when we check what's the state of this future, it's not completed yet. So the code actually progressed further. Uh, then we convert Scala future to Zero future here, uh, which is much more performant. And when this Zero future completes, we finally print the result. So you can also see that it uh, does complete at some point. Uh, what it gives us is that we can uh, be both highly concurrent uh, in uh, Kotlin world and in Scala world. So, to summarize, Scala and Kotlin code can uh, co coexist in the same project, and if you're working on a big uh, code base, <coughs> it, may, uh, it may make some sense to do that, especially if you have this split of do it, doing stuff quickly and doing stuff the right functional way. Uh, if you do that, <coughs> prefer working Kotlin code from Scala, and uh, the reason, as I specified in all of my examples, Scala is a much more powerful language. It has uh, much more features. So it will be quite hard to reuse Scala code from Kotlin. Uh, but uh, creating uh, uh, adaptation layer in Scala would be pre pretty easy to do. <laughs> so you can use the uh, adapter design pattern for that. And uh, Scala also provides us uh, converters to bridge the languages. Uh, as i shown, I will try to avoid using unit, especially in return types. Uh, it will uh, clash and it will clash badly uh, between Scala and Kotlin. And be extra careful around asynchronous code. It's uh, really easy to get it wrong and it's really easy to block uh, your execution track. And if you're back in Scala, uh, I really recommend you to use Zeal. So, thank you very much. Those are my Twitter, Medium, GitHub, and uh, my book uh, links. And if there are any questions, just feel free to catch me uh, later uh, on one of the breaks. Thank you very much. <coughs>